نعم بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن اهتدى بهدى ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله اللهم لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما وارزقنا فهم النبيين وحفظ المرسلين اللهم افتح لنا حكمتك وانشر علينا رحمتك يا ذا الجلال والإكرام وصل اللهم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله الكرام ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته and uh, welcome everyone to uh, I think this is our 13th session and inshallah we will be doing um, Surah Al-Kahf today from ayah number 45 till 49 inshallah and we will also look at the um, Arab section of the Ajurum Mia poem so I'm going to start off with that inshallah um, just to make a quick correction about last week's session, um, I had mentioned about the, I, I had said uh, Descartes' uh, gambit. It is actually Pascal's gambit or Pascal's wager. Um, and uh, it, it was proposed by the uh, philosopher, mathematician and physicist um, Blaise or Blaise Pascal. Um, and uh, I think some of you guys also discussed this in the group, which was excellent. I think you really grasped the concept of it. And I would encourage you to discuss it further because it's not necessarily his uh, proposition. It's, um, it's really a rational existential thing, a, a truth that is established in human thought. And uh, the Western world tends to do this uh, a lot. They try to, uh, you know, take on a hegemony of uh, knowledge amongst themselves. So, you know, you have so-and-so's theory and so-and-so's law and so-and-so's principle, and when it is really just a, a common truth. So you see similar arguments such as that also made by <clears throat> Imam Ali, as I mentioned. Um, another argument was made by... Uh, uh, Marcus Aurelius, um, another argument was made by Socrates in uh, Plato's recordings uh, of the Apology, Socrates' Apology. So it's it's something that, you know, just by applying just general reason, the rationality of human nature will ultimately have to accept Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or God Almighty as existent and the only refuge for humanity. <clears throat> and this is because, as we said, it is fitra, I mean, it, it is human nature to believe, right? And that belief is justified in the truth, and that truth can be rationally comprehended. Um, so it's part of human nature to come to that conclusion. Whichever route you take, you will ultimately come to that conclusion. So just a correction on that uh, note. Um, okay, are there any questions relating to the previous session? that we can go into first before we start the session. Okay, if there are no questions, then I'll start the session. And if later on, maybe the questions come up, we can address those, inshallah. So I'm going to share my screen. Uh, <clears throat> where is it? Share. Okay, so we'll start with the section on the Ajurumiya. It's a, it's. I've taken a few lines because it's all part of the same section, uh, the same chapter, but uh, we'll not cover all the elements today. But I will go through them, inshallah. So this section is called Bab Babu Ma'rifati Alamatil Ayarab. The section on understanding the signs of Arab. Now Arab. Uh, a very interesting thing to note. Let's do it here. A Arab comes from the same root word as Araba. 
And i'rab means, in technical terms, it means inflection. Not infection, inflection. Meaning there is a sort of a fluidity, a dynamic to the language. The more inflectious a language is, the more dynamic, the more... Um, uh, the the more meaning can be packed into words, uh, individual words can be morphed in even a slight way to encompass a different array of meanings. Um, in in its natural state, it really means to cl clarify or to make clear, and that's what essentially the Arabs believed was the root essence of speech was to clarify what the individual was thinking or what they wanted to express. The more polished your language was, the more clearly you could articulate your thoughts, ideas, and feelings and such. Now, what's interesting with the root Araba, and this is uh, one of the things that the Arabic language can do from the same root letters, Ain, Ra, and Ba, you can have different configurations. So you can have Araba, um, you can have Abara, and then you can have Bara'a by reconfiguring these letters. And they all mean different things, but in the Arabic language, these meanings have some sort of association, like they're linked together because they're part of the same semantic field. In the earliest classical sense of the word, Araba, in its meaning, quite literally meant language. And it was a constituent of all the aspects of language, which includes Lugha, primarily Lugha, and Nahu was not really established at the time. So Nahu was sort of part of that. Nahu meaning grammar as a science, because they spoke grammatically, you know. Um, the, the language was proficient in the sense that they intuitively spoke grammatically correct. Then you have balagha, which is rhetoric. Um, and Nahu is, these are the three main components, Nahu. The three main components. Um, and then Mantiq came later on. Mantiq is really part of the of the Lugha itself because the language itself has to be logically expressed. So in the Greek tradition, they had what's known as the trivium of language arts. Um, you had uh, logic, rhetoric, and grammar. So language constituted all of these. Later on, when the sciences were developed in these, the Islamic tradition, Lugha became language. It became a, a, a separate component by itself. And that's the contemporary meaning of the word language. The classical meaning of the language, of the word language, is really just the expressive ability, a medium of expressing thoughts and ideas. So Araba really meant language in the classical use of the word Araba. And this is because the Arabs basically, and, and it goes back to ancient cosmologies, how they viewed the world. People were not distinguished primarily by their race or ethnicity. They were, but that was secondary. They were distinguished primarily by the language that they spoke. And uh, language is one of the ways in which people can really be classified to truly trace the origins of a people, where they've come from, language is should be. I mean, now it's not. They use genetics and all these other things. And this is part of the eschatology where, you know, quantity is placed above quality. Language is quality. And something like genetics and genealogy, that's more quantitative, uh, quantitative science. So Araba is language. Now, Abara means to cross to cross a ma'bara, a ma'bara is a bridge. My writing is very bad today. A ma'bara is a bridge or a point of crossing, meaning 
it is a junction whereby you move from one side of a breach where there's a partition into another side now. So when you go to the border, you usually have border crossings, right? You're leaving one domain and going into another domain. One of the sayings of Nabi Isa and some attributed to Nabi Luqman, I'll write it down for you. He says, Ad-dunya ma'baratun or mu'biratun depending on the dialect. Ma'baratun fa'biruha wala ta'miruha wala ta'miruha that the world the dunya is a bridge so cross over it and don't build on it or cultivate on it right and that's the idea of the abra here the abra means to cross over so what language really does is it changes your state it crosses you over from macro cosmological states i wouldn't say cosmological but you know major states to even minor micro states you could be have you could be okay you could be uh, happy and then in one moment somebody says something to you just one word and it changes your state completely from being pleasant to now being grumpy right that's what language can do to you i can give you positive words and take you from a state of negativity and put you in a state of positivity and likewise what it also does language as a medium carries the immaterial aspect of meaning like your thoughts and your expression or your 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 thoughts your feelings your ideas these are immaterial they are from the alam al amr language carries that and crosses it over from that dimension into this earthly dimension this worldly dimension and the same thing somebody can look at some words read some words or listen to what somebody else is saying and then draw out the meanings of those into his inner aspect now from one dimension into another and so bara'a means means excellence yeah excellence would be the would be the would be a good word for that a good uh, translation so language, when it is properly executed, when it's properly used with the proper clarity, um, proper etiquette, proper structure, it can cross you over from a state of ignorance into a state of excellence or knowledge, right? And related to that now, if you look at the word ilm, and then there is amal, same three letters, right? Ain, Lam, and Meem. And then there is Lama. Ilm is knowledge. Amal is action. And Lama is like to shine or to glow, right? To shine or to glow. So when somebody has knowledge and they implement it, they use it the right way, using hikmah. They use that knowledge with wisdom. Then the resultant of that is that they have a glow, they have a shine, or we would say that this person is brilliant. There is, the person has a brilliancy to them, right? Because they are shining, they are excelling in that. This is the excellence I'm talking about. Because knowledge cannot be transmitted without language. And the action itself is an action of crossing over. Right? And lemma. So, this is just a concept that I'm giving you to understand now what is the purpose of 
Arab in language and why this section is really important to, to understand um, and of what benefit it is. Because I know a lot of people usually look at it and say, how does it benefit me, right? Whatever knowledge you seek, the, the question you would always ask, how does it benefit me? So you will see now the importance of clarifying words in a statement of knowing the position of each word, what's being done to it and why it's being done to it. So here, the, the scholar here, Al-Ajroom, is giving you in snippets, in, in short forms, what are the signs, the alamat al-i'rab, what are the signs? Because we learn through signs. And language itself is a constituent of signs and symbols. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teaches through signs. When he says, Ar-Rahman, Allam al-Quran. What is the Quran? But a collection of ayat, a collection of signs. And then he's given you signs pertaining certain things. He's given you signs regarding other things. He's given you signs regarding the foreseeable or unforeseeable future to the finality of humankind. What is the purpose of those signs? Is it just to know them or is it to understand them? Because in Arabic, for example, I can say Daraba Zaydun Amran as a basic statement. Or let's take a different statement because that's usually used. So Dahaba. Uh, Zaydun. Mm. Minal. Masjid. Now, by look by for me by looking at this statement, I know that the haba is fi'lu madi, and it is mabni. Meaning it does not change because mabni does not undergo i'rab. So in Arabic, you've got two categories of words. You've got mabni and you've got mu'rab. The mabni doesn't change. It doesn't undergo inflection. It remains as it is. The mu'rab undergoes inflection. So there are certain words that never go, they never change their structure. Fi'lu madi, the past tense verb, is one such word. It never undergoes any change. If it is dhahaba, it will always be dhahaba, regardless of where it is placed in the statement. If it is shariba, it will always be shariba, regardless of where it is placed in the... So by looking at this, if you can identify what this word is and where it's, what its categorization or classification is, then you always know that the haba will always be like that. It's never going to change. So even without these signs, you can easily read that and you know it's the haba, right? And that comes with practice. I also know that Zaidun is going to be with the Dhamma Tain at the top. Because Zaidun is the file of the statement. So he will be Marfur. He will not be Mansub. He will not be Majroor. Because he is the file. If there is a fi'il, Kullu fi'ilin yahtaju ila fi'il. The doer of the action. Right? Then I know that this is Harfujar. So this will always be min. It will never change. It will not be man. It will because I know that the part, the thing that's coming next to it after that is an object. It is not a person. So it can't be man. If it is man, then you'd be referring to a person. Man hua. Who is he? Right. And I know that masjid, although it has alif, although uh, by but without the alif and lam, it would be with dhammatain. But I know that because there's alif and lam, I have to remove the dhamma tain and put a regular dhamma on that. But I also know that because it is being affected by a particle, I removed the dhamma and I have to make it a kasra. You see? Now, all these words that I'm saying, this marfu'u, mabni, mu'rab, mansub, jar, majroor, all these are signs because that's essentially what we are studying here. We are studying the signs. We are studying the signs, right? So when you understand the signs, 
then you don't need to have them physically there. You already know what the signs are. You can recognize them and you can understand them and you, and you move on. You see, that's the whole objective. Once you understand a sign, you move on, you go on, you move forward. If you don't, if you're not able to move forward, then you can't really make any progress in knowledge, in learning. So grammatically now, this is what the scholar is doing here. He's, he's telling you, these are the signs. And this is where the signs are going to be applied. The signs of, the signs of inflection of Arab. So he starts with Arraf. And we say that there are, there are four. Raf, Nasb, Jazm, and Jar, or Khaft. Right? So he's starting with Arraf. So he's saying, Lirraf'i Arba'u. For the Raf'i sign, there are four. There are four signs, Alamatin. The first one is the Dhamma, and then the Wow, and then the Alif, and then the Noon. So if you were to maybe draw a graph of that, for the rough A sign, there is the Dhamma. al wow al alifu and then unknown. And now he's going to explain one by one which one it is. So for amma dhamma tu, and then the next line is wa amma al wow, and then the next line wa amma al alifu, and then the last line wa amma noon. So let's do just this top one for now and we'll see if you are able to grasp it then we move to the next one if not then we'll take it slowly okay so there are four signs that you're looking for in any statement when it comes to the rough there will be nasb signs and jazm signs and jar signs as well but when you're looking for rough there are four so fa amma dhamma tu as for the dhamma fa takunu alamatan li raf'i fi arba'ati mawadi as for the dhamma sign um, it becomes in, an indicator of the rough in four um, categories or instances. In four instances. So the first instance is fil ism. In the noun, you will have the rough. And then, oh, sorry, fil ism al mufrad. The singular noun. The singular noun. Mufrad. You should remember this also. Make a note of this. You have categories of Mufrad. Muthanna. And then Jam'u. So this is a singular dual plural just remember this as a side note because the arab will use these words so ismil mufrad the singular noun wa jam'i taksir the broken plural and i'll i'll show you an example of the broken plural وَجَمْعِ مُؤَنَّثِ salim And the feminine sound plural. So you've got broken plurals and sound plurals. Let's see if I can pick out an example in these ayats. So a broken plural is essentially where the structure of the word has been broken. So for example, the word... Kitab, that's the root word, kitab, right? But the plural is kutubun. See, this structure has been broken now because this alif has been removed and then these two have been joined into kutubun. That's a broken plural, 
Mm, another example can be like Alim, for example. Alim is a singular scholar, right? You have Alim. And then you have plural, which is Ulama. So this is a broken plural because this Alif has been removed. And then this has been joined here. And then another Alif has been put in the end with an additional Hamza, Ulama. That's a broken plural. So that's why it's called Jam'u Taksir. Now, in this case, the Jam'u Taksir is not referring to the, to the male nouns. It's referring to the female words that are have got a broken structure when they undergo a plural, plural uh, formation. I don't see one here. So inshallah, when I come across one, I'll point it out. And the fourth one is al-fi'l al-mudari, the present tense verb, alladhi lam yattasil bi akhiri shay'un, which at the end of it, there is no other thing added. It's by itself. The present tense verb by itself. So, The Dhamma, yes. So the Dhamma has got Ismul Mufrad Jam'i Taksir Jam'u Jam'u Mu'annath Salim and Elul Mubhari. These four. You guys should make your own uh, proper flowchart. This will be very, very useful when you have a proper flowchart. If you want to do a full chart, that's fine. If you want to do it in segments, that's fine. But it's excellent because you'll be able to refer to it easily enough. All right. So there are these four inst inst instances. The masculine word, singular, uh, sorry, the singular noun, the broken plural, the sound feminine plural, and the present tense verb, which at the end of it, there is nothing there. That's the alama of, of uh, Rafi when it takes on the Dhamma. Is everyone with me so far? Let me give a couple of examples to see if I can find one here. Jam'u Mu'annath, Jam'u Taksir, Fi'lu Mudari. I don't see one here. Oh, here we go. So here, here. This is a good example. No, that wouldn't be it actually, because that's Fi'lu Mudari. Here we go. Walam yadlimu. That's a that's a present tense verb, and there is nothing else attached to it. Right. That's a present tense verb with nothing attached to it. So, what is the alama of it? See, what's the sign of it up there? It's a dhamma. So, if this sentence was written like this. Without the signs on that, you can still read this. So if you know the sign, if you know that this is the ruling that's applied to this word, wala yad limu, you wouldn't say wala yad lamu or wala yad wala yad limi or yad lama or something like that. It's, it would be wala yad limu. Um, sorry, wala yud. What am I doing? Wala yadlimu rabbuka ahada. Um, see another one.
Oh, I'm just scanning through to see if I can find one here. If no. okay, I I don't see I don't see any. But maybe when we go through the eye, I will probably see it later on. Is there any question to this point now, the Dhamma? If there are no questions, I will assume that you guys are geniuses and you've understood everything, including my broken explanation. <laughs> okay, inshallah. When you when you practice it, you will start gaining uh, a bit of traction in understanding them, inshallah. Do you, would you like me to proceed with the next line or do you want to keep that to another day? Anyone can answer for, for anyone, it's fine. Maybe next time. Okay, we can leave that to next time, inshallah then. So next time, next week, inshallah, we'll do the wow. And then uh, with the alif, the, actually the wow even is not that difficult. The alif is once you grasp the dhamma, it the rest all become clear. For instance, the noon here is only applied for the present tense verb under under the conditions. The alif is only applied to dual nouns, nouns that are are in a dual form. That's it. And the wow is used for the opposite of these in two categories: the sound plural and the five. Asma'ul Khamsa that I mentioned. Abu, Ahu, Hamu, Fu, and Du. That's really it, actually. But we can we can do that next time, inshallah. Actually, let me go through it and then we'll I'll do more. I'll I'll re, we'll do a, like a review next week, inshallah. Yeah. We'll do all four lines as a review next week, inshallah. So as for the wow, wa ammal wow. Fatakunu alamatan li rafi fi maudi'ain. In, in in two instances, right? Fi jam'i mudakkar as-salim in the sound masculine plural. So you see this one, the dhamma goes in the sound feminine plural, but in the masculine plural, it takes on the wow, what's known as wow al jama'a. And wa fi al asma al khamsa, and in the five nouns, five sp special nouns which he has put it poetically here, abuka, ahuka, hamuka, wafu, wadumalin. The actual noun is the du, but the malin, he's just added it into elaborate how it's used. So du malin, the possessor of wealth. Dhul karnain, the possessor of the two, uh, whatever, horns or ages or epochs. Um, and the dhul, dhul kifl, for example, is the same, the possessor of. So this is these these are the instances that these um the the wow is used. So Jamu Mudakar uh Salim. And and you also you should remember this because they will also use this in uh in uh in grammatical analysis. Very simple, Mudakar. And mu'annath. Masculine, feminine, that's it. Mudakkar, mu'annath. And the asma'ul khamsa. The five nouns, that's it. So wherever you see an asma'ul khamsa, like now when we go to the section on dhul karnain, you will see that. You'll see you'll see how the inflection also takes place because in one instance it's dhul karnain, then it's dhal karnain, then it's dhil karnain. It changes, it becomes, it gets a ya on it, it gets an alif on it, it gets a wow on it, like that. Wa ammal alif, as for the alif, فَتَكُونُ عَلَامَةً لِلْرَفْعِ فِي تَثْنِيَةِ الْأَسْمَاءِ الْخَاصَةِ Tathniyatin is a way of saying the dual form. So 
specifically the alif is used only for nouns that are in the dual form. Um, I don't think there are any examples here. Uh, what kind of, uh, okay, there are no examples here, but we'll we'll see it inshallah. You'll see some instances where a word has been split. For example, um, like you can say a student, one student is talib. Two students, if the noun is not affected by anything, like a harf or any such thing, you could say Taliban. You see this alif is added in the end there. Taliban. This alif here. This is indicative that this word is in a state of rough. That's how it would, it would come in. Like you would see a, something, a word has been extended by alif and then noon at the end. As for the noon, فَتَكُونُ عَلَمَةً لِرَفْعِ فِي الْفِعْلِ الْمُضَارِ فِي الْفِعْلِ الْمُضَارِ إِذَا تَسَلَ بِهِ ضَمِيرُ التَّثْنِيَةِ So, as for the noon, its sign of raf is in the present tense verb when it is joined or additionally there's, a, there's an added character at the end of the word with the dual pronoun or the plural pronoun, dhamiru tathniyati, dual pronoun, au dhamiru jam'i, the plural pl pronoun, au dhamiru mu'annathil mukhatibi, or the pronoun in reference to the second person feminine. Feminine. So there is one example because I recalled it from memory here. Yaquluna. You see that Yaquluna alamatu raf'iya is the noon. It's not the wow. The wow is wow jama'a. That's the plural pronoun. The noon is its alama of raf. Let's take a different example. Let me share the, the conjugation. Um, actually, let me just uh, screenshot this and yeah, I can import it into that. Uh, yeah, this will be easier. Um, Or oh, did I stop my share? Let me share it again. Okay, so here I've taken the verb dahaba in the mudari malum section. So you can put it in the in the conjugator and you will see it. So I've taken the verb dahaba. He went. Okay. So the first one here, if I just look at this, I should be able to deduce who is speaking and, 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 and what's the pronoun designation. So I know that if I see an Alif Hamza at the beginning, this will always be Ana. If I see the Noon at the beginning, this will always be Nahnu. Now, if I see the Ta at the beginning, these will always be second person. And if I see the ya at the beginning, except for this one here, except for this one, if I see the ya at the beginning, it's always going to be third person. So the alama of raf that we are looking for is the noon. And what did he say here? Dhamir atta'niyati, the dual pronoun. So the dual pronouns are these ones here. And Tuma. Here, the same thing, Antuma, feminine. And that's the noon there. 
This is still in a state of rough, even though there is a kasra at the end. Even though there's a kasra at the end, its position in the sentence, unless it is affected by something, if it is not affected by anything, its placement in a sentence will be a placement of rough. It will be in a state of rough, right? And the same case applies to these other two here. Huma. Huma. Yadhabani, tadhabani. This is taking on the feminine. That's why it's the. There's no other reason for it because it's distinguishing the masculine from the from the feminine. That's why it's taking on ta, right? So here again, the same thing. The sign of it is the noon at the end. The second category he says is the miru jam'i. The pronoun that takes on the plural. Which ones are the plurals now in this case? In the second person, it would be antum and antunna. That's your noon right there. And the same case applies to whom and hunna. That's your noon. And the third category he says is al muannath uh, al muannathatil the feminine second person speaker, which is here. Tadhabina. Anti Tadhabina. None of the other none of the others take on the noon at the end. These have a different way of rough, of deter determining their rough. When he goes to the section on the um, uh, the Arab of the of the verbs, and then he's going to explain it more in detail for the others. But for now, that's it. As far as rough is concerned, these are the categories. I'd strongly recommend you make a flowchart, something that's better than this scribbling of mine and put in these uh, sections. Put your English translations also there if you want. And whenever you come across an ayah and you see one of these words, then you can look it up and, and, and reference the chart and determine if it is in a state of rough or not. Remember, 85% of the work is to be done by you. <laughs> you have to investigate it and then see how you're able to progress through that. If you have any questions, inshallah, we can always discuss later on. But this is not a class primarily on Arabic. It's more on the Arabic of the Quran. I'm just giving you the instruments that will help you at least understand how the Arabic of the Quran works. Okay. Are there any questions till this point? No questions. Okay. All right. Is... Anyone due to pray Salah in the next 10 minutes? Sister Hina, you have Maghrib, I think. Uh, no, actually the time changed, so I prayed before 6.30. Okay, so Maghrib is going to be later for you? No, we already prayed Maghrib. Oh, you already uh, prayed. Maghrib. Okay, okay. Now All right, so, okay, so maybe what we can do is take a break here. It's uh, 4.45 for me. We can take a 10-minute break here. And then we'll resume in 10 minutes. And then we can start off on the on these five ayat, inshallah. Okay, so I'll see you guys in um, 10 minutes, inshallah. Jazakallah khairan. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Wa salatu wa salam ala ashrafil anbiya wal mursaleen wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Bismillah. So, um, continuing with Surah Al-Kahf, ayah number 45 to 49. I want to stop at 49 because from 45 to 49, there is a collection of concepts in there. And then there is a further elaboration from ayah number uh, 50 going over to the next section. And then there is another section also in there. So these are 
expansions now, sort of um, commentary, a sort of a khutbah within the surah itself. It's explaining the concepts, the root concepts. So ayah number 49, let me share my screen. Ayah number 49, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begins, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wadrib lahum, present to them, where's my pen? Wadrib lahum, present to them, mathala, an example, al-hayati dunya an example of the life of this world, of this dunya. Now, hayat, life, it's a very complex thing to really understand. You know, when we ask the question, what is life? And there's a difference between asking what is life and what is the meaning of life? What is typically gears towards the quiddity of a thing? If you remember, I mentioned quiddity, mahiyatun. It's asking about the nature of a thing. Like if I ask, what is a pen? And then you start explaining to me, what a pen is. You're asking about the nature of the object. What is the meaning of a pen goes in a different direction. It's geared more towards the purpose or the objective or the ambition or the goal or any such related uh, element. What is its meaning, right? Hayat can be classified into existence, overall existence of the human being from the point of creation, not just life in this world. So hayatu dunya is a very specific component of the overall existence of mankind. You have the dunyawi, the dunyawi existence, which is fulfilled in a location that is called Al-Ard. Um, there are essentially five modes of existence for the human being or five stages, what are known as the ages of man. There's the pre-worldly stage, and then there is the worldly stage, and then there is the deathly stage, there's a state of existence during death and however long that will be. And then there is the, um, the stage of resurrection and then judgment. Um, and then there is the eternal stage after that now, either paradise or hellfire. So these are, these are five stages. In these five stages, there is this one stage in between, which is the dunyawi stage. So that's the Hayatu Dunya. It is the stage of this worldly existence, Dunyawi. So what's the, uh, what, how do you understand this worldly existence then? This is what's being elaborated in this ayah. Because what was the argument going back to the rich man and the poor man? What were the components that he was arguing? The rich man was arguing from a Dunyawi perspective. And the poor man was arguing from an existential perspective. He was giving a superior argument over the dunyawi exists or over the dunyawi argument. Right? In a hadith, I believe it is in the Sunan of uh, it's in the Musnad of Imam Ahmad, uh, Musa and Adam have a debate between them, between the two of them. And Musa says, Aren't you Adam, the father of all of us? It was because of your mistake that we ended up being thrown out of, of the heavens. And then Adam said, aren't you Musa, the one to whom was given the Torah, the, the foundation of knowledge? 
why would you blame me for something that was already ordained by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And in that, the Prophet wasallam said, Adam defeated Musa in argument. Musa was giving was coming from a logic that is worldly related, cause to effect. You did this, and then the effect was this, right? Adam was giving a different kind of logic that doesn't abide by the dunyawi side of things. He was giving an existential argument that overrides the dunyawi argument. He was giving an argument by saying, it wasn't in my control. You're discussing causes and effects. But as far as this matter is concerned, or all matters are concerned, there are no causes and effects. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordains it like that. And this is, in, in, this is established in, in philosophy, in, in, in Islamic philosophy. I mean, the Western philosophy still argues causes and effects. But Islamically speaking, there are no causes and effects. What we relate to as a cause to an effect is simply just a, a materialistic perspective of things. But in reality, Allah is the one who makes it happen. And the proof is from the Quran. Like, for example, when it came to the fire that Ibrahim was thrown into, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded the fire to do what? Be cool and be safe. The fire still burned, but it did not burn Ibrahim and it did not harm Ibrahim. In other words, the effects were suspended for him. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can remove the effect of a thing. It's not by default that there has to be an effect to a cause or a cause to an effect or that the two might be linked in any ways. So in philosophy, there's an argument regarding what's known as the causal nexus. The causal nexus is the links between causes and effects. And the conclusion of most philosophers is that no such links exist. There is no such link. We're just attributing one to the other. We're doing the association of one to the other, but there is no such link in any case. And that's why the existential argument always wins over the dunyawi argument. So how do you understand the nature of this dunyawi aspect of existence? And why is it low compared to the existential aspect of existence? This is what's being provided here now. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving you the universal concept of it by using an allegory. So he says that the example of this worldly state of existence, kama'in, it's like, like water. Anzalnahu, we send it, the water, mina sama'i, from the sky. So look at here exactly what's being highlighted. The first point that is being elaborated here. He doesn't say that the rain falls from the sky. See, it's not a cause to effect, effect uh, scenario. It's not that the, it's an example of the rains from which the, ra the water comes from. We send the rain down from the sky. And, and this, you can do a bit of research. There is a hadith, it's a sahih hadith, um, in which the Prophet Sallallahu says that there are five things that whose knowledge no one knows except Allah. And one of them is when rain is sent down. Like you can, I mean, even people, they will argue, you know, or we can give a forecast and we can whatever, but you don't know. You, they really don't know, right? They can send a balloon up and it can see ahead and whatever and measure the humidity and all that. But those are only signs. They're just signs that they're using that, oh, okay, rain is coming. And then they calculate how soon it might come and whatnot. But when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordains those signs themselves, like the humidity to change or whatever, uh, the winds to shift or the clouds to form and all that, only he knows when that happens. So this rain that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends down from the sky, bihi nabatul ard. it mingles or is absorbed by the vegetation of the ard. فَأَسْبَهَا hashiman. After that, then it becomes like a dried remnant. تَدْرُوهُ riyah That ends up getting scattered by the wind. 
So the rain comes down, it mingles with the vegetation, fa'asbaha, and then it becomes uh, like a dried red remnant. It, it, it becomes like dust particles, right? Um, like the, the vegetation soaks up the water, then it dries up, and then it starts breaking apart. It withers, and then it's swept away by the wind. وَكَانَ اللَّهُ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ مُقْتَدِرًا and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is above all things, all powerful in, in, in his ability to control all that. Remember, qaddara yuqaddiru, he has a control over all things because he knows the completedness, the full measure of all things in all their aspects. When a thing will initiate, how long it will take, how is it going to subside, he knows that. From the human vantage, something might last forever and then it suddenly ends and you have no idea what happened, where, where did it go wrong. What's being elaborated here in this entire statement is the temporality of things. The temporality of this world. That's the nature of this world. Everything is temporal in this world. It might seem like it's long lasting. It might seem like it will never decay. It might seem like it will never end, but it eventually does. And that eventuality is not in human control. Al malu wal banun. This is continuing, by the way, the same elaboration of Hayatul Dunya. Al malu wal banun. Zinatul Hayatul Dunya. Wealth, progeny are the adornments of this Hayatul Dunya. So not only is this realm temporal, but it is adorned by these two things in their comprehensive aspects. You look, people will look at something like a land, it's barren, it's got nothing, but then they will actually give it a value. It's got some wealth in it. It can be cultivated, it can be developed, it can be done this and that. People will amass their wealth. Ultimately, they reach a point in their life. They realize, what am I going to do with all this wealth? I don't want it to be going to somebody else. I want it to go to my children, my inheritance, my legacy. I want it to continue in my progeny. That's essentially the two pursuits of man, ultimately. It's the only way he thinks that he can immortalize himself through his wealth or through his progeny or both. Now, it's very interesting. These are the only two components that the rich man was arguing as his defense. Remember what he said in that, uh, uh, in that ayah? Ana aktharu minka malan wa a'azu nafara. I have more than you in wealth, then that's your mal, wa a'azu nafara and mightier in numbers. And we said that the nafara in that also includes his workforce, his labor force, and his children, and his, and, and because children were considered to be wealth also. The more children you had, the more wealthy you were seen to be in society, right? That's essentially his argument. And that's the argument being cornered here or being counted here. Well, what else is there? Can you boast anything else? Once this goes away, what else can you boast? Or what else can you do, say that you have better than somebody else? And in Surah Al-Shu'ara, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says what? Ayah 89, 88, 89, I believe. Yawma la yanfa'u malu wa la banoon illa man ata Allah bi qalbin salim. On that day, it, nothing will benefit of wealth or your progeny. It's one of these two or both of these. Neither of these are going to benefit. For those who ask the question about, and, and so accept for the one who comes to Allah with a sound heart. And he'll explain also that aspect in the next couple of ayat. The Prophet wasallam said in, that, in the hadith, إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَاتِ Uh, and then he said, فَمَنْ كَانَتْ هِجْرَتُهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ فَهِجْرَتُهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ That's one aspect. وَمَنْ كَانَتْ هِجْرَتُهُ لِدُنْيَا يُسْرِبُهَا أَوْ إِمْرَأَةٌ يَنْكِهُهَا There are only two. 
your your pursuit will then either be towards the dunya way to build your wealth or to get married and settle down and have progeny and children and whatnot. That's it. It's, it's a temporal thing. It's not even worth mentioning. It's got no existential value to it. Now, that doesn't mean you don't do it or you don't pursue wealth or you don't, but that cannot be your primary. That's the point here. This cannot be your primary pursuit. And that's the argument that the poor man was making towards the rich man. That, listen, you have this, recognize that it's from Allah. Don't make this your God that you end up worshiping this, right? And, and towards the end of time, there's a hadith in uh, Sunan, Ibn, uh, uh, Sunan Abi Dawood. And uh, I had given a talk on this a year or so back when I, when I introduced the word Circus 19. Um, he says in that hadith, uh, rajulu fiha wa, wa yumsi kafiran. In the morning, a uh, man will wake up uh, a mu'min and in the, by the evening he will be a kafir. And then he said, Hatta yasiran nasu ila fustatain. Until mankind will end up being divided into two camps. And he said, Imanin, uh, fustati imanin la nifaqa fihi. The camp of, the, of iman does not have nifaq in it, hypocrisy in it. Wa fustati nifaqin la imana fihi. And the camp of, of hypocrisy doesn't have iman in it. Clear black and white between the two. And then he finished by saying, فَإِذَا كَانَ ذَاكُمْ فَانْتَذِرُوا الدَّجَّال مِنْ يَوْمِهِ أَوْ مِنْ غَدِهِ If you, and you see that, then expect the Dajjal on that same day or the, the day after, yani immediately or uh, as soon as that happens. That essentially, ultimately, it's these two camps that will be finalized, that the filtration takes place in these two camps. And that's why he says, Yawma, he begins that ayah in Surah Shura, that is going to be on its one side. Except for the one who comes to Allah with a sound heart, that's going to be on the other side. And the sound heart is a heart with iman. And the unsound heart is a, is a heart with doubt, or, and which manifests in hypocrisy, which is deluded and distracted by wealth and progeny. Because your direction will either be towards your, your income and your business and your wealth and your this dunyavi aspect, or it will be an attention to your children, right? And so now he's, he then says in, that, in this ayah, وَيَوْمَ نُسَيِّرُ الْجِبَالَ وَتَرَ الْأَرْضَ بَارِزَةً وَحَشَرْنَاهُمْ فَلَمْ نُغَادِرْ مِنْهُمْ أَحَدًا and on that day, on, an, on, on that day, we will move the mountains and you will see the earth as completely flat or flattened. You will see it completely flattened. And we will gather all of them. Oh, so, uh, stop for Allah. I missed here. I stopped here. I have to continue here. So, al-malu wal banuna zinatul hayati dunya, wealth and progeny are the adornments of this worldly life. Wal baqiyatu salihatu. So, this is that camp, the first camp. This is the other camp. Wal baqiyatu salihatu. But those deeds or those actions that you do that have an intrinsic value such that they are everlasting. خَيْرٌ عِنْدَ رَبِّكَ ثَوَابًا وَخَيْرٌ amala Are now, they are going to be better with Allah in the reward that they will gain you and in the, um, in, in the hope that it will cultivate in you. The, 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 the hope that will keep your heart uh, steadfast and sound. The deeds that you do, the righteous deeds that you do that are themselves intrinsically everlasting, those are the ones that will really help you. Everything else you're going to leave behind. I mean, it's a classical philosophy. Uh, we all 
think about this. We all say this, you know, you're not going to take your suitcases to the grave. You're not going to take anything. I've seen people posting all these pictures also on social media, you know. It's they they use it more as a consolation, you know, five minute Islam. But there is a lot of depth to it when you sit down to really think about it because it has to really touch you. Not just touch you in terms of your feeling, but your heart. It has to ignite something in you, right? And on that day, when we, this is the day that he's talking about, the finality of it, when the mountains are going to be removed, when the, uh, the, the, the earth the, 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 is going to be flattened completely, all these tall, tall buildings and everything that you're building, everything will be wiped down. And we will gather all of them. And not a single one of them will be left behind. Each and every individual will be brought forward. And they will be presented before your Lord. And they will be presented before your Lord. Soften in ranks. And you'll find an expansion of this in another surah. Hmm. Why am I forgetting? I'll remember the name of the surah. I'll tell you where the, where the, where the ayat are, inshallah. Please remind me in the group. I'll look it up for you. You'll find, you'll find the expansion of these ranks. Uh, Indeed, you have, be, you have now come to us in the same manner that we first created you. When we created you the first. So this is... In, in, the, in the resurrection of the human being, we Muslims do not believe in a duality of existence, right? We believe that the human being is complete, even though there are three components of body, soul, and spirit. There they are three components, but it's a complete collection because one without the other doesn't make the human being. So the resurrection also is complete, body and soul. In the same way that we created you the first time, we created you the next time. Okay. The second time. Balzaamtum Allah Naj Al Allah Lakum Mawida. But you were claiming that no such thing is going to happen for you. We are not going to make an appointment for you. That's the claim of the rich man. I don't think this is ever going to end. And then he said, What? I don't think the hour will ever be established. Yeah, this, I don't think there's going to be judgment. You don't think that you're going to be gathered. You will be gathered. That's the point here. Wawudi <clears throat> al-kitab. And then the book now, the record of all your deeds will be put forward. Fatar al-mujrimina mushfiqina mimma fihi. And the mujrim, the, 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 the criminals now, these criminals. And what crime is this? It's crime against God. In everything that he told you not to do, you did. In everything he told you to do, you didn't do. These are the criminals. You see, they will now be fearful of what is in that record now. Because here is the register being brought in front of you. And he's looking at this register. He's not yet opened it. Now he's afraid. What is this? And then he opens it. And then he starts reading what is written about him in there. وَيَقُولُونَ And then they say, يَا وَيْلَتَنَا Woe unto us! مَا لِهَذَا الْكِتَابِ لَا يُغَادِرُ صَغِيرَةً وَلَا كَبِيرَةً إِلَّا أَحْصَاهَا There is not a single thing in this book, whether big or small, that has not been recorded. Everything that I did, that even I thought I had forgotten, has been recorded in here. And they will see exactly what they had. They will find exactly what they had presented. Each and everything that they did, they will find it in there. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not do injustice on anyone. It is all there for everyone to see. If you wronged the other person, and you, and, and, and you concealed it or you hid it, you lied to them, you know, and that person did not even know. Now it's all out in the open. You talked about somebody else. 
backbited them, spoke badly about them. And then to their face, you are all, I'm your friend. It's all out in the open. Everything that you did, it's all out in the open. This, I mean, if you understand this, it should really put to you, you know, put you in perspective or, or give you a perspective of your life, yourself, individual. Remember, the Quran is speaking to you directly. It should put you in a state of consideration. Will they not reflect on this Quran? Will they not think? Will they not ponder? Or is there a lock on their hearts? Right? This is what this commentary is about. Reflect now going back to the argument that the rich man made against the poor man and the poor man countered against the rich man. As far as the dialectics go, the, the, the dialectical di uh, uh, discussions go, the dialectics, as far as the discourse goes, as far as the mutton or the shar or whatever theory, all that goes, it, you can debate it this way or that way because it's all semantics, right? Ultimately, one argument will have to win over another argument. But what do you draw from that eventually? And then consider now the environment and the age that you are living in and the transition that this age is going through. Where do you stand as your proper place in relation to yourself, in relation to everything else, and in relation to your Lord? In the next section is when he will now elaborate even further going now into the actual components. He's going to talk about Iblis. He's going to talk about the devil's argument. Um, he's going to give you... Inshallah, we'll take a look at those next week. Inshallah. Let's um, stop here and get into any questions or discussions or comments, inshallah. Now, go ahead. What if something is someone else's fault and that's obstructing you from doing what is for khair, something good? In terms of what? A person of authority is, uh, let's say, abusing their authority or refusing something to happen that is for khair. It's that person's fault and it's you're not able to get through. So this is where the Nia plays the, the dominant part because what's the Nia that you had? As long as the Nia was clear, it was sincere, and it was true, when you went to implement it, there were other obstacles created that were not of your doing. In other words, there was an oppression taking place. In that, you always have to remember that Allah always sides with the one who is oppressed. Allah does not side with the oppressor. He will always side with the one who is being oppressed. And so long as the oppressor is, is the one who is putting you down, the more he oppresses you or she oppresses you, the more your reward increases. In an incident with Abu Bakr uh, anhu, and the Prophet وسلم, somebody was insulting Abu Bakr and uh, really going at him. Uh, offensively, verbally. And uh, Abu Bakr was quiet all that while. And the Prophet was quiet while he was doing that. Until finally Abu Bakr reached his threshold and he started countering the other person. And the moment he did that, the Prophet وسلم, walked away. Afterwards, Abu Bakr asked him, not out of, you know, like, why didn't you have my back sort of a deal. More towards understanding because whenever the Prophet did something, the Sahaba took that as highly important not to be missed. There's something here that I need to know to learn from. And so he asked the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you know, why did you, when the guy was attacking me, you didn't say anything. But when I started defending myself, you walked away. And the Prophet said, while he was attacking you, the angels were defending you. 
And the moment you opened your mouth to defend yourself, the angels went away. And a prophet of Allah cannot be where angels are not. Right? So, so long as the oppressor is impeding you from doing what you need to do, then know then that you are at the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not at the mercy of the oppressor. Right. What if it's government procedures, things like that, not oppression specifically? Yeah, yeah I mean, that's, it's there because that's the, the world that we're living in right now. These systems are not def designed for you to do good. They're designed for not to, to prevent you from doing good. This is, this is the world we're living in. This is the age of the Dajjal. Because the choice now here the human being is given is to either be subservient to Allah or be subservient to the Dajjal. Right, and the system is not designed to make you subservient to Allah, it's designed for you to be at the mercy of the Dajjal. So, you do what is in your means, and then you surrender to Allah. And that's really the end of it. You have to re remember that Allah is above all things, and this is what He says Allah is above all things. You see, He says, It doesn't say, right. If he says, Fi kulli shayin, then it would mean in all matters, Allah is all powerful. He's saying, Ala kulli shayin muqtadir, above all things. Right? So, whatever the oppressor is planning, let them plan their plans. Allah will plan his plan. You be subservient to Allah, do what is in your means, and then leave it. Because at the end of the day, if Allah has put that tribulation in your path, remember that he is testing your patience, he's testing your faith. If you falter and despair on the matter, you fail the test. But if you hold yourself and keep on persevering, he will unlock the doors for you. If it was not through here, it would be through somewhere else. And you just have to keep persevering. You try a different means. If it doesn't work, you try a different means until you've exhausted all your means. Then you accept and surrender. You know, this is, this is my limit. I can't do any more than this. Then whatever Allah has ordained for you, you recognize that there's going to be higher in that. I mean, this it's I'm I know I'm I'm not really giving it its weight, but there's no other way of saying it. It's just really something you have to grasp yourself. Now go ahead. Brother uh, Mujahid, go ahead. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. So I had a question um, in verse 34 of uh, Surah Kaf. Uh, the first uh, from the two garden is the first one. He says, Nafara, as the word uh -huh. he used for uh, children and men. And then the, uh -huh. his companion used the word Walada in verse 39. Uh -huh. And in verse, let's find it. In verse 46, Allah SWT says, Wal Banun, Al Malu uh -huh. Wal Banun. Could you just tell me the difference between these three words and the wisdom behind it, maybe, if you have any thoughts? In the first instance, what the guy was really saying is he wasn't really regarding his own children as children. He was more seeing them as additional hands to support him. And I, if you have ever met people who are really wealth-oriented, you know, they will raise their children in a manner that they control the children's future and their destinies all so that they could ultimately bring those children under their umbrella. You see, so my son is going to take over my business. You know, I'm a doctor, so I want my daughter to also be a doctor. You see, they kind of, that's the mentality that they raise their children, which they see them as objects. And and there's a different way of seeing your children as well. This is the, the walada here now is he's looking at it from a different way. He's not seeing his children as workforce, as additionals, or they are going to carry my legacy forward. You know, my name will be on the corporate building like Trump so that that one's son takes over and Trump's net brand name continues. And then his other one carries forward and, you know, it goes further than that. They're not looking at it like that. That's the walada there. Banun includes both as a whole in general. It's the comprehensive, right? 
So it's how you raise your children that determines it. It's how you raise, it's how you use your wealth that determines where you fall, which category you fall under. In this case, they are not synonymic. You have to remember that the Quran doesn't use synonymic terms, even though they might be or seem synonymic, but in context, they are specific. So in the context of this one's speech, the word nafara is used, but because it also includes not just his children, but also his workers whom he has employed and everything. It includes all that. That's why he's saying in that way. But he's not looking at it because he, the, the, the poor man doesn't have the workforce. He doesn't have the garden and everything. He doesn't need all that. All he has is his children, maybe. So he's looking at it as my children. I hope that makes sense. Exactly. Makes sense, yeah. Thank you. Um, go ahead, Brother Roshan. Assalamu alaikum, Ustad. Uh, alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. Um, just have a question on the previous class. Um, now, like you say, when the register, when our book is going to be presented to us, how are we going to be like fearful, right? Or what's inside it? And um, also when the Quran is speaking to us and if it gets to our heart, we have the same feeling like we become fearful of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is speaking to us. Mm -hmm. Now there's two ayah from the Quran. It's a bit long, but I'll try to just um, put it in my own words. Uh, in Surah Al-Hashr, ayah 21, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, if we had sent this Quran onto a mountain, mm -hmm. you would have seen it humble, crushed to pieces, mm -hmm. out of fear of Allah. We make such examples for people so that hopefully they will reflect. Now, here, I guess it's a metaphor that it's an example that Allah is sending the Quran to the mountain and the mountain cannot take it. Right, mm -hmm. out of fear of Allah. And in San, like we are like if we are like able to understand the language of Allah SWT, we'll have the same feeling, we'll have the fear of Allah in us. Now, in another ayah from the Quran, um, in Surah Al Araf, ayah 143, uh, this is in regard to Musa alayhi salam. He said, uh, Allah says, when Musa came to our appointed time and his Lord spoke to him and he said, my Lord, show me yourself so that I may look at you. Allah said, you will not see me, but look at the mountain. Mm -hmm. If it remains firm in its place, then you will see me. But when his Lord manifested himself to the mountain, he crushed it flat. And Musa fell unconscious to the ground. When Musa regained consciousness, he said, Glory to you. I turn in repentance to you. And I am, a, I am the first of the believers. Now here we have Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealing himself to the mountain. And the mountain crushed into pieces. And in the other ayah, we have the Quran revealed to the mountain and the mountain crushed into pieces. Now, if we analyze those two ayah, can we uh, deduct um, that Allah revealing himself is the Quran is speaking to us uh, the same thing? That's my first question. Uh, if you can answer it, I have a follow-up question after that. Okay, in the in the ayah in Surah Al-Araf, um, Allah did not reveal Himself to the mountain. He didn't reveal Himself to the mountain. It was a condition. He makes a condition to Musa. When Musa says, "Rabbi, arini anzur ilayk," show me yourself. I want to see you. And He says, "Allah, lantarani." You will not be able to see me, but look at the mountain. 
And then he gives a condition to Musa here. فَإِنْ إِسْتَقَرَّ مَكَانَهُ If it stands where it is, فَسَوْفَ تَرَانِي If it remains where it is, I will reveal myself. In other words, who is more powerful, the mountain or Allah? فَلَمَّا تَجَلَّ رَبُّهُ لِلْجَبَلِ جَعَلَهُ دَكَّنْ وَخَرَّ مُوسَى سَعِيكَ But when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the word here, tajalla, is the majesty of Allah now. He didn't reveal himself. He revealed his majesty. Who is more powerful? The mountain, as large and strong as it is, or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Because ma mountains are considered to be majestic. In, in poetry, mountains are used to elaborate uh, the majesty of, of things. So, فَلَمَّا تَجَلَّ رَبُّهُ لِلْجَبَلْ When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala showed his majesty to the mountain. Not himself. He didn't reveal himself. It's just his majesty. And the mountain collapsed just by that alone. The mountain could not bear it. Right? In, in Surah Al-Hashr, لَا يَسْتَوِي أَسْحَابُ That's the first. لَا يَسْتَوِي أَسْحَابُ لَا يَسْتَوِي أَسْحَابُ لَا يَسْتَوِي لو أنزلناه لا لو أنزلنا هذا القرآن على جبل if we were to have sent this Quran if we were to have لو أنزلنا if we were to have sent this Quran on a mountain لا أرأيته you would surely have seen it خاشعا متصدعا من خشية الله you would seen it humble itself خشوع it would humble itself from the khushu'a of Allah, out of fear of Allah. Meaning, the mountain refuses to take on the responsibility of playing with the speech of Allah. It goes back to the other ayah um, in Surah Fussilat, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that then thereafter he directed his attention, he directed himself to the samawat when it was in a plasmic state. And then to the Ard, he asked both of them, come willingly or by subjugation. Either come by yourself or I force you to come to obey me. And they both accepted. We are not taking a chance here. <laughs> we come willingly. We accept. So inanimate objects, غير aqil, do not take a chance with Allah's ordainment. They follow the rule and the law of the Lord Almighty to the letter. There is no interpretation. There is no maybe this, maybe that. Circumstances have changed, blah, blah, blah. It's none of that. The rule is as it is. Everything that is inanimate. غير aqil. The aqili is the one who has been given the ability now to decide whether he wants to do it or not. In other words, within that de 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 decision, he has the ability to reject it. He has the ability to say, I don't want to follow you. I don't want to do what you tell me to do. He has that ability. Allah has given him that. Right? That's the comparison that is being made here. The human being, and you see the Mufassirin will, will give you this as a background. The human being thought himself too smart to take on what the mountain refused to take on. <laughs> right? Uh, but the two, in terms of what Musa encountered and what this is saying here, this is an allegory here. Allah is giving us an allegory, a comparison here. You see, if the mountain humbled itself before Allah's ordainment, then who are you to challenge Allah? Can you take on a mountain? Can the human being take on a mountain? You see? And yet you want to challenge God? And yet the mountain humbled itself before God. Right? That's the comparison being made here. This is what also Musa has been is Musa has been told, you can't see me. But if the mountain remains standing, then I will show myself to you. In other words, if the mountain defeats me, then I then I have no purpose. Right? That's essentially what is being said. If something like the mountain can challenge me and win over me, then I have no purpose as a god. Why, why would I call myself God? I will reveal myself as just whatever. And so when that happened, the mountain collapsed, meaning he is God, he is supreme, his law is supreme and sovereign. And so long as that remains, 
he has said that that rule that you cannot see me until the day of judgment and no one can change that rule because no one can challenge god almighty you understand did i did i answer your question you you said you had a follow up yes yeah yeah you yeah you did answer my question here so uh, in another ayah from the quran uh, allah described the mountain as pegs that hold the the earth together so we don't uh, like the earth stays still beneath, beneath us like doesn't move even though the earth is rotating but it's still still we can stand on it we can walk on it right now there's another ayah um so basically the mountain is much stronger than than a human being that's what uh, i get from that ayah and if the mountain cannot take the majesty of allah then who are we right so you're correct now there's another ayah in surah al ahzab ayah 72 um, allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said we offered the trust to the heavens the earth and the mountains Mm -hmm. but they refused to take it on and uh, shrank from it but men took it on he is indeed wrongdoing and ignorant this was so that allah might punish the men and women among the hypocrites and the men and women uh, of the belief um, I think the men and women of the uh, hypocrites and the mushrikun mm -hmm. and so that uh, uh, Allah may reward the men and women of the believers. Allah is ever forgiving and most merciful. Uh, now the trust here, mm -hmm. uh, I know it needs to be explained. Um, uh, or interpret it because it's it's one of those ayah that we have to to ex to interpret them. Is mm -hmm. that referring to to the Quran, the trust? Um, in terms, of, I will have to look deeper into the tafsir to see exactly what different mufassirin have said about the word. Um, inna aradna, inna aradna al amanata, the this amana. What what is this amana? I know some have said that it is the Quran. Others have said that it is the 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 the, the, the governance, right? Allah chose man as a Khalifa, um, the vicegerent, and this is a high responsibility, which no one else has been given or entrusted in all of creation with. Uh, so it would we'd have I'll have to look into the tafsirs and see how the different mufassirin have explained it. And I would suggest also that you do you do take a look at that. Um, but I mean, from the ayah, from its outward sense, it can it can be understood that I'm, you could also say that it is knowledge itself, this amana, because knowledge is this trust and how to use it and how to implement it because knowledge is at the root of all things like without knowledge you can't do anything anything that you want to do even if it's to worship you know even if you want to brush your teeth you have to know how to brush your teeth knowledge is really that you could say that it is this trust of knowledge which no one else wanted to take this responsibility um but inna hukana zaluman jahula uh, man was volume and jahula and and here the dhulm is paired with ignorance because if you take on this trust you know without really understanding what it entails you are going to make monumental errors so in the ayah that follows it he separates the believers from the idolaters and the munafiqeen and both male and females just so there is no uh, dispute on the matter. لِيُعَذِّبَ اللَّهُ الْمُنَافِقِينَ وَالْمُنَافِقَاتِ وَالْمُشْرِكِينَ وَالْمُشْرِكَاتِ Right? And then he says وَيَتُوبَ اللَّهُ عَلَى الْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَالْمُؤْمِنَاتِ وَكَانَ اللَّهُ غَفُورًا رَحِيمًا 
that despite all that, Allah is still forgiving and merciful. So even if you fall in the other category, so long as you seek tawbah, you believe in Allah, you can still come on this other side. And really knowledge is the greatest burden of all. Anyone who has any ulama, any true scholar will tell you that it is an immense burden. In the, uh, in the early tradition, uh, Islamic tradition, the ulama did not like to speak on... In fact, if you go back right up to the Prophet's time, there were very few Sahaba who ever gave fatwa. Very, very few, like you could count them in all of Medina and then even a little after that as well during the expansion of the Muslim lands. In the early scholarship, the, the scholars did not like to, um, to, to say about something being haram or halal. They didn't. They would say, you know, if, if by their evaluation, they didn't think it was right, they would say something like, you know, I don't like it or I'm, I'm not happy with that. Unless it was qat'i, if it's something that is clearly defined, yeah, then they would make a decision on that. It's only of this, of, of recent now, this whole haram, halal, haram, all these muftis coming up, giving fatwas left, right, and center. It's a misuse of knowledge because knowledge is a huge, huge burden. It's not, it's supposed to, it would, it would free you if you use it rightly, but you also have to reconsider the responsibility you have when you acquire knowledge because it can easily turn you from a believer into an arrogant individual. Right. It can easily flip you around. Oh, I'm better than him because now I have, you know, I studied fiqh and this, so I have more knowledge than that. I know what they're doing. And people actually make these mistakes. I've seen ulama make this mistake. And I'm using ulama in like the degraded, not in the esteemed aspect of it. Those degraded, those so-called scholars, we would call them, right? Make judgment on the faith of other people or to speak on what's going on in their heart. Like as though they have some, you know, mystical power now that they read a hadith or two and they can now judge what's another person's, is in another person's heart, you know? And then they pass takfir on them. Oh, so-and-so is a kafir because, you know, like this and like that. And uh, this is what I would say from my, uh, Wallahu alam, of course, do a bit more research on that to see is it a specific amana and what is that specific amana or but my by my evaluation it would be something like knowledge in its entirety and then the quran in its in its particular as part of the whole all the knowledge that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed unto mankind now yes. another question Go ahead, brother uh, Mujahid. Is that me? Sorry. Um, um, I had a question, but it's related to a later verse of Surah Kaf. Shall I ask now or shall I wait? Of Surah? Of Surah Kaf. Um, is, it, is it coming later, inshallah? Like after, or is it something we've already so it's, it's related to one of the first verses and one of the uh, later verses, like in comparison. Um, maybe hold on that question then. Okay, when, when we cover at least the, the rest of it, then then it would we can compare the two ayat. No worries. Okay. So. Um, okay, there's a question on the chat to me directly. Um, if if you write a question on the chat, um, better to write it in the. Don't don't message me directly because sometimes I don't see it. Uh, if you write it generally, then maybe somebody else can 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 ask the question on your or or remind me that there is a question. Otherwise, I won't I won't see it. Um, okay, so the hadith that only Allah knows the knowledge of when rains are coming or whether modifications down that came to mind. What is the difference between the rains of Allah and the rain Shaitan manipulated? Is it still rain? They knew it's coming as they manipulated it. The rain that comes from Allah is pure rain. The water is pure. The rain that's manipulated, yeah, they do cloud seeding and all these things. The rain that's manipulated is never pure. And it will have adverse effects. 
it will always have, and those effects may be pronounced or it may be, uh, you know, it may take time for them to manifest in which they get away with it and they start saying, oh, there's no relation between this and that. Yeah, this doesn't cause that. But it's it's impure and they don't know it. See, this goes back to the other ayah, which in Surah Baqarah, where it قَالَ لَهُمْ وَإِذَا قِيلَ لَهُمْ لَا تُفْسِدُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ قَالُوا إِنَّمَا نَحْنُ مُسْلِحُونَ they don't even sense it what they're doing they think that they're doing right yeah but because they manipulated it so they can then say yeah see we know exactly when it's going to rain <laughs> it's like you push a boulder off the off the cliff and then you go down and say the boulder is going to fall in 10 seconds yeah you're the one who pushed it it doesn't mean you predicted anything you staged the whole thing anyway yeah. That's the ayah. It brought things into perspective and scared me. We are living, no, we live thinking there are no eyes watching us, around us. But Allah is watching through his majesty. Our own fingers and eyes are recording things. It's like everything around to us is a camera. Exactly. In the hadith of Jibril, um, when he speaks about Ihsan, what does he say? And ta'abud Allah ka'annaka tara. You serve Allah as though you can see him. If you can't see him, you should know that he's, he's watching you. So everything is witnessing you. And this is this alam here, this world, this realm is also called alam al alam al shahada. It's, it's the observable realm, right? And everything in this realm is in a state of observing. Everything is watching everything else. In in my book, The Crucible of Abstinence, inshallah, I'll publish it soon. I've almost finished with it. But in one of the lectures also that we did, um, I spoke about the will and, and how much, what, what is the will in relation to your worldly existence? And then the will when it is on Yom al Qiyamah, right? And, and we said in the, in, in from, from the Quran, um, uh, what's the ayah? Now I'm getting a bit tired now. Uh, it, it's, it's on that on that day that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wal amru yawma'idin lillah the, the will on that day is only Allah's. Yani in this world, in this worldly state, you've been given a will and the will of everything else has been made subservient to your will. So your eyes are subservient to you. Your hands are subservient to you. Everything is subservient to you. Their will is subservient to your will. That doesn't mean that they're not observing what you're doing. In a hadith, the Prophet wasallam said, every morning, all the part, body parts... They tell the tongue, Ya Lisan, be careful. <laughs> what you say, we are going to also be drawn into that. Right? Like they are also, these are also conscious entities in their own limited consciousness because everything in this realm is a conscious entity. Existence is a conscious experience, right? Everything has its own conscious limitation. It might not be. Uh, sapient in that sense like aware and intelligent and interactable but it has its own conscious limit and so everything is observing and on that day the will is taken away from you you no longer have control over these things and they will testify because they will now be subservient right now they're subservient to your will on that day they will be subservient to his will and he will compel them to speak against you everything that is in record will have a witness this is something like, like you really have to bring to, if you've ever been in a justice system, like you've ever gone to court and battled a case or watched lawyers trying to build an argument, the, the best case scenario of justice is when there is proof, tangible proof, in this case, the kitab with a record on it and witness. That's open and shut case <laughs> right so everything that's written in that kitab will have a witness 
something or the other will be brought out to witness against you or testify against you. Anyway, I'm dragging on the question. So, but that's a good observation. On please send your message to, to the open group. So if I don't see it, somebody else can remind me. If you send it directly to me, I won't might not see it at all. Now go ahead. Another question, Sister Hina. Assalamualaikum. Alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. Um, the two ayahs, uh, suppose uh, where it is said that Wallahu ala kulli shayin qadir. Uh -huh. And here uh, it is Wakan Allahu ala kulli shayin maqtadira. So uh, is basically the meaning same or is there any uh, uh, grammatical change in, uh, in Surah al Kaf? Yes, so this is uh, ayah number 46. Oh. The, the meanings are similar, but they're not the same. The meanings are similar. The, the word is used in relation to the context in which is, it, is, uh, yeah, uh, it is applied, sorry. So Muqtadira and Qadir, uh, they are... Uh... So Muqtadira is really that he has a full ability, like he, the ability, see, so mankind has an ability to estimate things, to measure things, right? Uh, you have the ability to use an instrument to measure something. And once you measure something, you know what it is. But with mankind, there's a deficiency in measurement because all your measurements are guesswork, the best guess, estimative. This is called wahmiya. It's a faculty of the intellect. You have five faculties. One of them is wahmiya or, or waham, um, which is an estimative faculty. The ability to calculate is not complete. This is why mathematicians can never determine what infinity is. They don't know how large a number it is. They just, they don't know it. That's actually it. They just don't know what it is. Like they don't know where infinity is as a calculation, as a quantity, because they can't measure entirely. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is perfect in all his abilities because he has full measure over all things, right? And then in the, in the other ayah, uh, uh, which ayah was it? Just remind me. Uh, in which ayah? Sorry. Uh, I don't remember the ayah number uh, or the surah. Uh, Qadir. Qadir is more to do with power now. So in, embedded in that same word is like I said, you have the ability to measure, which means you have the ability to control it, right? If I, if I, even in terms of human beings in relation with other human beings, if I know you in all your aspects, who you are, your psychology, I can somewhat control you. I can, I can influence you to do something that I want you to do. And, and for that, I need to know more and more about you. Psycholo psychiatrists will tend to do that. They will ask you questions to get more information out of you so that by that information now, they can then see, okay, this person can be categorized in this, you know, he's got this characteristics and I can turn the knob here and turn the knob there and bring him around to where I want them. Salesmen will do that. Bad salesmen, terrible salesmen will do that. They'll ask you questions to gain more information out for you. So that they can then see, oh, okay, all right, so this person has this thing and that thing and I can do like this and then they'll bring you right where they want you to. That's the control now. That's how media manipulation takes place. That's how social media manipulation takes place. And that's one of the reasons why the more information you put online, the more information they have against you <laughs> so that they can control you because they are, with that information, they are building more and more about you in terms of measuring out who you are. When I'm saying measurement here, I'm not using measurement like tape measure or a ruler or something. I'm not saying distance like centimeters. It's really encompasses all aspects. It's not just the physical dimensions, you know, like measuring a person's intellective ability. By asking them a few questions, you're able to gauge how sharp they are, you know, how smart they are, how cunning they are how much knowledge they have. That's what the measurement is. So this, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has full measurement of all things. 
ergo he has full control and power over all things so that's the that's the muqtadira and the qadir combined together he has qudra right they, they come from the same root word and um, uh, sorry uh, in the same ayah uh, 46 mm -hmm. uh, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says the enduring deeds are better uh, near your Lord in reward and hope. So is this in some way related uh, uh, to the fact that, you know, if uh, we get some fire in uh, the dunya, that is not uh, as uh, uh, for a lack of words. It is not as good as uh, people who suffer in this dunya, but uh, like the poor man, but the, their, their uh, hope for reward is in the hereafter. There's a hadith. Give me one second. Let me just turn on my light. There's a hadith. I will find this hadith for you. Um, I think I have it in my notes. Okay. Uh, no, I don't have it here with me. I'll find this hadith for you. I'll post it on the group as well, inshallah. There's a hadith in which the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, um, he drew a line in the sand and uh, he marked he made markings on that line and he said here and then he, he drew a box outside those markings and then outside the box he drew another line and that line he called it the amal or, or imla the hope or aspirations of the human being and he said this is his life it starts here and this is where the death is. If 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 this doesn't, if this tragedy doesn't overcome him or test or something, then if he misses this, this other one will catch him. And if he misses that, this other one will catch him. Meanwhile, he is trying to reach out for this thing, this aspiration of his, which is outside his scope of reaching. That's the nature of dunya. Dunya, one of the meanings of dunya is it's just out of reach. It's like grapes, um, which which you desire, and it's you. The more you try to reach for it, the further away it goes. It's just out of reach, and so this hope that you're reaching for is out of your reach. That's the nature of the dunya. We said I'll find the hadith for you, inshallah. I'll post it uh, in the group. That's that's the hope of this world, because you, you need hope. Human beings cannot sustain themselves without hope. This is the heart. What is the heart looking for? And we're going more into now these, the spirituality of the human being. The heart is looking for what? For truth so that it can believe in the truth. In between the two, it's hoping that this is the truth. It's looking for something to cling on to because it needs contentment. It's always turning, right? It's always agitated. It wants to be stable. And that's why it is always aspiring for something. So what do you place your hope in is the point here. Would you, this is going now same as Pascal's wager. What would you rather bet on, place your wager on, the finite or the infinite? Because if you lose the finite, you've lost the finite as well as the infinite. Right? If you gain, you gain the infinite. And if you lose, you lose just the finite, right? So this is the hope now. The hope of this world is a temporal hope. But for those who have Iman, regardless of whatever occurs in this world around them, so whatever circumstances happen, whatever issues take place, the Iman keeps them intact because they know that the hope that they want is not of this world, it's of that other world in that they have recognized what is their purpose of existence in this realm. It's a temporal existence and they have to move on. They're not going to stay here. Ad-dunya mu'biratun, ad-dunya ma'baratun, fa'biruha wa la ta'miruha. The realm is a bridge. This, this dunya is just a bridge. 
what do you do at a bridge? You cross over the bridge. You don't start building a house and putting up your tent and building a garden on the bridge. You have to cross over until you hit something solid. Then you can aspire to do something, right? That's the nature of that. In that ayah, the the well, baqiyatu salihat, the righteous deeds are those are the things that will give you this hope. This 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 intrinsic hope, this eternal or everlasting hope, the hope that doesn't betray you. Because the hopes of this world will betray you. But that hope will not betray you. The, the, the righteous deeds that are everlasting. It's not just the deeds. It's not just righteousness. It's righteousness that will last forever. Things that you do that have a value above and beyond the worldly aspect of it. Those will keep you intact and their reward is much better. Because Allah will still reward even the disbeliever, even the kafir, even the mushrik. If they have done X amount of good, they'll get their reward for that. Obviously, it's going to be weighed against everything else that they did, but they'll get their reward for it. In Surah to nur Allah says that the deeds of the kafir are like a mirage in the desert. It has no substance. It has no value. It's not lasting. It doesn't last. And he's thirsty. He's looking for water until he reaches this mirage and he doesn't find anything except Allah. And Allah pays him in full. He settles his debt because Allah is swift in settling his debts. So even the deeds, the good deeds of a disbeliever, of a kafir, of a mushrik, of a munafik, or whichever other category is there, they'll get their settlement. But it is not lasting. And much of it is actually settled in this world. So that in the akhirah, it has no weight. It's already been paid for here. Right? I hope that makes sense. Yes. Uh, so if uh, a believer gets uh, reward in this dunya, will it... Uh diminish his reward in the hereafter? I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't go into that speculation because okay. what Allah gives as a, as a reward can also be a test in itself. Because he says also that we will test you. He will test you with wealth and, wealth and health and your children. Now, children are a reward from Allah. If Allah gives you a child, that's a blessing. But he's still going to test you with it. <laughs> right? You you are poor and then he gives you wealth. It's a reward from Allah, but he's still going to test you with that. So it's it's not really in the sense that it will diminish in the akhirah per se, but he's given it to you for testing. And uh, one last question, please. Yeah. Uh, so uh, uh, suppose we have um, an option of um, spending time and gaining knowledge for ourselves and in uh, doing tarbiyah for children, which is also important, and both is, both are important. So how do we uh, balance between the two? What's because the last? The time is limited. Um, what's, what's the knowledge last piece? for how ourselves? Do you, yeah. How uh, do you knowledge how for do you? ourselves and mm -hmm. um, tarbiyah of the children? You know, mm -hmm. uh, teaching them about uh, Islam, and because that also takes up a lot of time. Mm -hmm. We only have a limited amount of time in the day. So how do mothers um, balance between children so so that it doesn't go against the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we are obsessed with our children? But we have to take out time for ourselves. So how can we balance between it's it's a very interesting question because it's essentially what everyone is facing in, in the world. There is a fiqh aspect of it, and you will see the scholars have given different ways in which you know you can balance your time. Imam Al Ghazali gives a good elaboration, but this was at his time and age. And then you factor in the eschatological aspect to it, and it presents a different image because it is it, the state of the world is that it's that life is what is dictating your existence rather than you managing your life your life is managing you and life itself is being managed by other factors as well the idea i mean it's not easy it's not a quick fix solution but the idea is to cultivate um 
your life in such a way that you are in control of what's happening around you and what you are doing or restructure your life in such a way as to accommodate all these other factors. In other words, or in short, it's time management. It's a matter of time management. Um, people actually feel, especially men, men will feel this way because a lot of men are working, they're employed, right? And the job is what's earning them their livelihood and that's what's putting food on the table. And so the entire family is structured around that factor, around the, the, the father's or the husband's work schedule and his working days and what he does and what time he's going to come home and all that. Everything is factored around that, uh, which is unfortunate, right? And it sort of, there's no independence as far as the house, rest of the household goes. So women who are caring for the children as well as the home, and they want to also now pursue knowledge, they sort of have to balance their way around all this, right? Then you add on another factor where, okay, children have to go to school. So now it's their timing as well. What time they're going to go, come back, their requirements, they have to be fed, they have to be, you know, bathed or whatever, and then put off to sleep. So all the schedules. So Ultimately, the woman of the household has to sort of maneuver her way around all these things. In my view, it should be a collective effort between man and woman, between husband and wife, because you're both parents. It's not, you don't have distinct, distinct roles between the two of you, even though one is a supporting figure and the other one is a providing figure, right? You both roles have to complement each other. That's really how marriage works in Islam. It's not the Western mentality is you do your thing, I do my thing, and we just fix everything else in between. In Islam, the man and the woman are complementing each other. And that's what the question that um, Brother uh, Ayman asked, he's not in the session today, he's not able to attend. Um, but the question that he asked regarding the ayah um, in Surah Baqarah, I believe. Uh, lakum, yes, Surah Baqarah. Lakum rafathu ila nisa'ikum. And then he says, Hunna libasun lakum wa antum libasun lahun. They are garments unto you and you are garments to them. Which means what? Which means you are a solace to them and they are a solace to you. You are a fort to them and they are a fort to you. You complement each other. The zawaj in Islam is not one plus one equals two. It's one plus one equals one. <laughs> That's why it's called a union. You see, <laughs> you, there are certain things that you can do that he can't do. And there are certain things that you know you can, you can do and she can't do. You see? And so you combine the two together. Muslims have this weird notion that nikah fulfills half the deen. Nikah doesn't fulfill half the deen. Nikah is just the one step. The rest is the marriage that will fulfill half the deen. <laughs> Fulfilling your marriage is going to fulfill half your deen. Because she will do things to encourage you to increase your deen. And he will do things to encourage you. You see, she will wake up before you for fajr and wake you up for fajr. <laughs> helping you fulfill your deed. You see, so it's a complementary thing. When you work together, then the tarbiya will come by itself. The mode of, because if you learn together then, if you collectively combine forces and dedicate some time between yourselves to do some classes and, and help each other progress, you this will be you will be amazed at how your home transforms because your children are not learners yet they are acquirers see children don't learn language they acquire language there's a difference between the two there's language acquisition and language learning adults do the learning children don't they observe and they absorb and when they absorb it changes their character within themselves so that then outwardly it manifests. When they see this union taking place be between mother and father, it cultivates them as well. They want to mimic that. Tarbiya will come by itself in that sense. Ta'aleem is separate from tarbiya, although both have to be done. Education in Islam includes both tarbiya, ta'aleem. 
there's the learning component, the subjects and whatnot, the sciences, and then there is the nurturing. You want to nurture at the same time you learn. So that even if you learn just two words in uh, two hours, you only learn two words, but you spend most of the time nurturing, like you're discussing between the two of you and your children are watching this discussion. You see, they will learn from that. Even if it's just one hadith or one ayah or just something small, just a lecture, you watch together, you take notes, they observe and they watch and they try to mimic. You see, you're, you're in a, you have to remember that you're in a world where you have to make it work. Remember the Sahaba asked the Prophet one question about the Dajjal and, and his time. How will we establish salah? See, it's not just about the salah. It's not the semantics. Remember, the prophet gives comprehensive, universal. And he said, you have to manage it. Everyone work it out. You see, you have to work it out. You're in an age where you just have to work it out. There's no set formula now. Everything is haywire, right? We do things in our household. We do things in a different way compared to somebody else's household. You know, everyone just, <laughs> the point is you recognize the situation you are in and you intellect and you make whatever effort you can make. And whoever takes on a path of knowledge, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will facilitate the way. Yes, Brother Roshan. Uh, yes. Um, yeah. One thing to save time, uh, I learned that later in my life. I always ask myself the question uh, before I do anything: Is I, I ask, is it what Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has uh, written for me to do? And that saved me a lot of time by answering that question first before even going into the task. Mm -hmm. But I have a question, a grammatical question here uh, on the word. Uh, um, mm -hmm. you translate it as uh, power, absolute power over everything. Um, uh, the root of that word is is uh, mm -hmm. Am I correct? Mm -hmm. So qadara also uh, we have qadar coming from qadara. Mm -hmm. Am I correct in that? Yes. So can we say that? Um, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordained everything. That's why he has absolute power over everything. Mm -hmm. And also at the end of our lesson, uh, when we're going to receive our, our kitab, which means that everything will be written down. Uh, so that's also like the ordainment um, that Allah has, has given us, uh, whether we've done it or not. Um, it doesn't like it will be it will be written in that book of what we did uh, whether we did it out of our own desires or we did it according to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prescribed for us to do so can we say uh, that Allah uh, has ordained or prescribed has power over uh, everything that he prescribed or ordained this is a question that uh, lies between free will and determinism, essentially. And it's a difficult concept to grasp because you want, it, it can fall on either extreme, <clears throat> complete free will or full control, fully determined. Every, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has, has control over everything. So those sides will ask, well, why do I need to do anything if Allah has control over everything? He'll just guide my hands and legs wherever he wants. And the other side will argue complete free will because God does not control me. I decide what I want to do. Imam Ali was asked this question and he told the man, lift up one leg. So he lifted one leg up. And then Imam Ali said, lift up the other leg without putting the first one down. And he said, I can't. So Imam Ali said, that's where your free will lies. Between that and that means there are parameters, there are boundaries. There are certain things that are in your control, right? Like I said, everything else 
has been made subservient to you within limitations. Tilka hududullah. There are these are the boundaries that Allah has set. Now, in terms of his knowledge now over all things, that's a different matter. Think about it this way. Let me share my screen with you. Although this is not related to our discussion, but I'll just put it out there a little bit. Think about this point in time right now, okay? This is where you're starting. Now, at this point in time, you might make one of two decisions, maybe three decisions. To go this way, to go that way, or to go this way. You might choose between one of these. If you choose this, if you make this decision, at this point, you will have to make a different decision. And then if you choose this one, at this point, you'll have to make a different set of decisions. And then at this point, a different set of decisions. Same case applies to this. And then somewhere else here. And then this will have a different... You see all these nodes here are points of your decision making. Each point you are faced with a choice, with a number of choices. Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not control which choice you make. That's in your, in, in your control. But he does know every single node that is there. If this is the pathway that you actually took through all your life, you could have taken this pathway, you could have taken this other pathway, you could have taken that pathway, this one, whichever pathway you could have taken, assuming that this is the pathway you took. Right? He knows exactly every decision you make or would have made and all the possible outcomes from that. That is the expanse of his knowledge. He knows every single possible outcome from every decisive point in your life and in every individual's life and the repercussions of all those numerous outcomes that will take place. Every point along that way, he knows. Your life, you perceive it as linear because you're following one pathway. You can't be in two places at the same time. You cannot make two decisions at the same time. Like you cannot eat your cake and keep it at the same time, right? <laughs> you can only do one of two things. So you, to you, your pathway seems to be linear, but there are multitudinal outcomes that could have arisen from any other decision that you could have made. For example, if I had chosen not to come migrate to Turkey and live in, in Canada, then my life would have taken a different course. Both of these... Whichever decision I would have made, Allah already knew what the outcomes would be for either of those. But he left the decision to me to make. And I asked him for guidance and he guided me accordingly, whether through an inspired thought or through somebody else coming in to give me an advice or through something that popped up or whatever it is, whether a circumstance pushed me in the direction, whichever means he put in the way is his way of guiding you. But the decision is yours to make. This is where the word Qadr, Qadr is a very old term. It's one of those ancient words. Because Qadr can mean like Qadr, just Qadr with a, with a sukun on the ra can mean fate or destiny. Right? There's a destination to all things. Qadara can mean to be capable or to be able to do something or to be potent enough to do something. Right? Um, Qadira can also mean the same thing. Then there is Qaddara, which means to measure, to estimate, to appraise, to value. Uh, then there is Qadr, which is the extent or the degree or the amount, uh, the limitation. Um, Qaddira means that he he measured or he has, uh, he he valued or he appraised. And and there are other meanings to that word as well and then whatever morphology they go through taqdeer for example is a different morphology uh, muqaddir is the one who is doing the action of qadr which means he has the ability or the potent of everything um, 
Qadir also is Qadir is stemming from a different uh, uh, semantic field of the same word. It's a very broad, very expansive word. It has to be understood in the precision in which it is applied. Remember, don't ever use just a dictionary definition with the Quran. Never do that. Dictionary definition, which is a logical analysis, logical semantics, but also then contextual analysis. So you use the dictionary and then also look at, because starting point is tafsir. What does tafsir say? Because scholars have examined this before. What are the different views and, and, and elaborations? How do you understand their understanding? You see? So contextually, what does it mean? Because an ayah in this case could be also related to a circumstance. What was the contextual uh, time period in which or circumstance that drove the revelation of the ayah? Um, like the one that I said about the men being garments, you are garments unto them and they are garments to you. That was, um, that was part of a sharah that came down, a hukum with regards to fasting, right? <laughs> But what I drew from that was an ishara. It's not a tafsir or a ta'wil. It's not even an interpretation. It's just an ishara. I hope I, I answered the question. It's a very complex subject. Understanding free will and determinism. And where do you place yourself? Uh, you just have to remember that there are certain parameters in which you do have a free will. You do have a choice. So don't ever just sit there and say, God will do whatever because he controls and he has power over all things. The decision to even think that is still your decision. <laughs> is there uh, any other question? Any Any other Okay, so we can maybe end for today. Um, <clears throat> I think for, for next week, we can, we'll start from ayah number 50. Yeah. We can do from ayah number 50 up until 59, inshallah. We can do those nine ayat so that the week after, inshallah, we can start with the uh, section on Musa and Al-Khidr, which is really my my most favorite section. So, I, And I know everyone's been looking forward for that. So we can finish these nine ayat. There'll be concepts in there as well, inshallah. And then we can start Musa and Al-Khidr. So 50 to 59, those are the ayat for the week. And we will, I will we'll also do a review on the section on, on Rafa or, or Marfura before we go to the others. We'll just review that once more. And maybe in those ayat that come up, some of the examples will also come up. So it'll help you understand further, right? Now, so we'll end here for now, inshallah. Subhanaka wa bihamdika nashhadu an la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk Rabbana taqabbal minna innaka anta samiyun alim wa tub alayna ya maulana innaka anta tawabu rahim bi rahmatika ya arhama rahimin barakallahu feekum wa salam alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh jazakullahu khairan jazakullahu wa alaykum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh